I'm Annalee Ward, the director of the Wendt Center for Character Education, a center whose mission is rooted in the university's mission and a center who seeks to foster intellectual understanding of and personal commitment to lives of purpose and excellent moral character. And so I am delighted tonight to be able to focus on lives of purpose, thinking about what that means. But first I'd like to begin with a word of prayer. So if you will join me. Almighty and creator God, for your glory you made us, and made us in your very image a God of compassion and justice, a God of creativity and work. God, thank you for purpose, for drive, and especially for the gift of work, even during those times when it can seem more like a curse than a blessing. But for the many who are unemployed, Lord, in your mercy, bring hope, bring employment. Forgive us, gracious God, when we abandon the common good for our own individual gain, or when self-interest takes precedence over others' needs. Give us courage to work for a world that reflects your goodness, and empower us with the vision to see that another world is possible, and your provision is real. Sustain us, teach us, grow us into a people whose many gifts serve your world through your one spirit. Amen. Tonight we have the privilege of hearing from Dr. Brian Dick. He is an associate professor at, the, at Colorado State University and a vocational psychologist. And he's called to many roles, teacher, husband, father of four active boys, entrepreneur, as a co-founder of Jobsology, a career assessment system being developed, or as he describes it, an e-harmony for employers and job seekers. Co-author of Make Your Job a Calling, How the Psychology of Vocation Can Change Your Life at Work. Dr. Dick is familiar with questions like, what should I do with my life? Or, what do I do if I hate my job? But more specifically, he and his co-author investigated the idea of calling. What is a calling anyway? And how does calling bring meaning and joy to my work? Using the rigor of quantitative research, insights from reformed theology, and the passion of a person who cares about others. Dr. Dick is here to share with us web-slinging and world-changing career guidance from Spider-Man, Martin Luther, and a hospital janitor. Please join me in welcoming him to the University of Dubuque. Thanks for the warm introduction. Uh, thanks to the university and to the Wendt Center uh, for bringing me here, um, to Anna Lee and Maria for coordinating the details, to Matt and Stephanie Schlimm and Isaiah for your hospitality and enduring friendship. And thanks to all of you for taking time on your Monday night to come here. Um, I appreciate that. So Sigmund Freud uh, is famous for saying, among many other things, love and work are the cornerstones of our humanness. Now, love and work are not mutually exclusive concepts, of course. Um, but I will focus tonight on work. But I thought I'd get started by talking a little bit about love, and romantic love in particular, because I, I understand, I recognize, I know how much people really appreciate, and students especially really appreciate, receiving unsolicited dating advice. Okay? <laughs> So, a lot goes into setting up a first date. I'm not going to go into that part. But once you're on a first date, there are two main objectives. Okay? The first is to make a really good first impression and maintain that the whole time during the date. The second is to evaluate the person that you're on the date with, 
to see if they are somebody that you would might, you know, want a second date with. Now this is not easy. You have to be very creative because you recognize that the person that you're on a date with is also trying really hard to make a good first impression. And so with Freud right next to me here, I feel compelled to suggest that you throw in some projectives during this first date. And I don't mean showing the Rorschach ink blots. I mean asking some poignant open-ended questions, the answers of which reveal the inner workings of the other person's personality and sense of self and motivations and, and so forth. So here's an example of one of these questions. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, if I asked a question like that, I would no longer be trying very hard to make a good first impression. And you would be correct. But it is worth it if you let your guard down a little bit and uh, reveal a little of your inner nerd. The information that you will get from this question is, is very valuable. And I'll explain a little bit what I mean. Now, I have some hypotheses here. I have not tested these. I assume some of the students in the crowd here are taking a research methods class right now, or will soon, and maybe are looking for some projects. So take this one on. Uh, and if you do, email me the results. I'll be very curious uh, to learn what, what you find. So, so I'll get you started. Here are a couple of hypotheses. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? If the answer has to do with um, some kind of physical feat, like Spider-Man or uh, Superman, you know, clears a tall building in a single bound, or the superhuman strength of Incredible Hulk, then you're dealing with someone who is either very athletic or, conversely, not at all athletic, but fantasizes about being really athletic. Okay, if the superpower that the person describes has to do with controlling the elements, like Polaris with uh, magnetism or storm, um, then you've got somebody who probably is pretty narcissistic, maybe has a god complex, some kind of deep-seated need for power. See, this is very valuable information from a first date. If a person um, talks about changing size as a superpower, not the sexiest superpower, um, but a, a useful one, like the Adam or Colossal Boy, how many Colossal Boy fans do we have here? Um, then probably that person is noticing that there's a height difference between the two of you. And I say that as someone who's married to someone who's 11 inches shorter than I am. So we kind of dealt with that a little bit. It's a little bit trickier if somebody talks about changing shape as their superpower. Like Mr. Fantastic, or, or even worse, uh, as a sort of a, a red flag if a person wants to take the form of other people, because this obviously reveals uh, a very strong sense of insecurity. They're not content in their own skin. They, they want to change themselves or be like others, right? Now, if a person talks about superhuman speed, like flash or dash, uh, that conveys something about what they are expecting from the relationship and how fast they want things to go, which is another red flag. Right? And if a person says x-ray vision, okay, I think, I think what's behind that is obvious. Now these are all kind of negative, right? That's kind of a drag. They're not all negative. If a person starts talking about Batman, they're not really answering the question because Batman is one of those superheroes who would never actually had any real superpowers. It's a big bank account and access to all kinds of cool gadgets and some martial arts training, uh, but no actual superpowers. Now this is good. If the person that you're on this date with says that, it demonstrates that they're an overachiever, which of course you already knew because they are on a first date with you, <laughs> right? I like the superhero narrative, and this is my segue <laughs> to talking about work, because um, it's interesting to think about what it would be like 
to have some kind of really um, interesting, unique um, power, strength, um, skill, ability that nobody else has. Because then you, then you ask that question, what are you going to do with this? Right? What are you going to do with this? And Peter Parker is a great example. You notice here I have the 2002 uh, Spider-Man. Uh, I've not seen the new one. It felt much too soon to me to start that series over. But Annalie assures me that it's very much worth seeing. Okay, fine. Um, but Peter, you have somebody who's a, a kind of a gangly, interested in science, kind of nerdy high school kid who's taking pictures for the school paper, and he gets bit by the spider, and changes start to happen, right? And he looks in the mirror, his physique has changed, he's got this uh, spidey sense. Um, in the movie, Spider-Man uh, begins slinging webs right out of his wrists. The actual original Spider-Man used his science um, knowledge to construct devices that he strapped to his wrists, but you know, that's okay. And, and, and he deals with this question, what do, I, what do I do with this? What do I do with this, right? Now he had options. He could have become a villain, um, but let, let's just assume that it seems obvious that the first thing that you'd want to do with powers like this wouldn't necessarily be world domination or causing huge harm to humanity, that kind of thing. So he got a little bit creative. He started um, trying out other kinds of things just to sort of see how it would go. Uh, for example, he tried wrestling. Uh, if you remember this, I think the winner, if he lasted three minutes, got 300 bucks or something like that. Uh, so that seems reasonable. Uh, I mean, how many people uh, you know, can do what he's doing in this picture here? Uh, so why not do that? That's a useful way to use these gifts that he has. In the original film strip, he went from the wrestling ring to the, the TV screen and actually starred in a, a, a TV series. Okay? Uh, but you know how the story goes. Uh, things happen. Uh, his Uncle Ben was murdered, and Peter Parker, as he's dealing with this, keeps hearing Ben's voice in his head, with great power comes great responsibility. And it is like uh, there is a hole in the heart of Peter Parker as he reflects on this. A and he begins to realize that in addition to seeking the person who murdered his uncle, he would thwart crime and the evils that were happening in his city. Right? And so that became his answer to the question, what am I going to do with this? What am I going to do with this? And of course, that's really the point if we're going to use Spider-Man as a person from whom we can take life lessons, each of you here has gifts. And I use gifts very broadly, okay? It includes abilities, skills. It includes interests, values, abilities. I already said that. Personality. You're unique. You're different from other people on all of these different characteristics. And the ways that you're unique have implications for what you can do in the world. So it's the same question. What do you do with this? Right? You've got things. What do you do with it? Now, if you're like me and you think about this question in terms of what is my calling, um, then it raises some additional questions uh, that are involved in this process of figuring out what am I going to do with this? The concept of calling has a long history. And I could spend a lot of time talking about different ways that it's been conceptualized, but I won't do that. I'll skip to the way um, we've defined it in, in our work in this area. And we've done so this way. As it applies to the work role, a calling has three dimensions. A transcendent summons, an alignment of work purpose with life purpose, and some kind of pro-social orientation. So a transcendent summons just refers to um, the fact that the word calling implies a caller, right? Something beyond the self that calls or compels a person to do something. The second thing refers to um, the sense that what I do day in and day out in my job, if this is a calling, should align with what I sense is my broader purpose in life. Okay, and the third thing, pro-social orientation, refers to the fact that this is not centrally for me. 
and my own personal happiness and fulfillment, but rather there is a sense of contribution that I'm interested in experiencing. I want to do things for the world around me, either directly or indirectly. I want to, to leave a mark, make the world better in some big or small way. Now this notion of gifts is a very powerful one that we've seen before. In the Christian New Testament, there are several passages that talk about the church as uh, using the metaphor of the body, right? So everybody who is part of the church um, works together like different parts of the body do. And uh, no one part can look to another part and say you're not important. They're different, but they're all important to the functioning of the whole. And here's an example of that from 1 Corinthians, the different types of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. Does this, does this uh, resonate with you? The University of Dubuque, as I learned today, has this German motto that is translated as many gifts but one spirit. Did I get that right? Um, so that appears to be taken from this passage, or at least certainly is consonant with it. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So there are different gifts, and those gifts are to be used in concert to advance the common good. Now, th these passages apply to the church, but the question is, is this a principle that applies outside of the church to society as a whole when it comes to people making decisions about their career and where they're best equipped to serve. Well, if you think that way, you're in good company because this is exactly what Martin Luther argued. Okay, now Luther um, came of age at a time when there was this very clear separation of sacred and secular. Arguably, that's still very pervasive in today's culture. But at that time, if you wanted to do something that was a calling, uh, that had spiritual or sacred significance, you would leave the world, so to speak, and enter the cloister, the monastery. You would become a, a monk, a nun, a priest. And um, Luther, uh, among many other things that, that he wrote about, really turned that on its head and said, no, um, wherever you are, in whatever station you find yourself, if you do it to the glory of God and for the well-being of others, uh, then what you are doing has just as much spiritual significance as someone who is um, exercising the spiritual disciplines as a monk or a nun, right? Now, I happen to really like this picture of Luther because he looks like such a normal guy in it. Like, I have students that stumble into my classes at Colorado State who look exactly like this. Uh, and, and you're probably more used to this picture. Don't you like this one better? Um, now, the thing with Luther is he lived in a different kind of economic context, than, certainly than we live in today. But things started to change in Europe not long after um, he put a lot of his ideas into writing. And by the time Calvin came around, there was some recognition that it's not necessarily the best idea to look at a person's station in order to, to figure out what their calling is. Because stations themselves, right, the sort of social structures that are in place, are just like human beings, vulnerable to brokenness. They're tainted with sin. Uh, they can be problematic. And so, um, whereas Luther would say, if you want to find your calling, look at where you are and serve God faithfully there. Calvin would say, evaluate where you are, and the Puritans after him would de develop this idea further. Look at where you are, evaluate it. And if you want to understand where you should serve, what your calling is, look at your gifts. Okay? Now that brings to mind somebody else, Frank Parsons. How many of you are familiar with Frank Parsons? A few, that's good. He's not the most famous dude, um, but he is known as the father of vocational guidance which is just tremendously ironic that he of all people would have this title because his own career path was extremely chaotic. Uh, so he went to school as an engineer, I think it was Cornell actually, got a job uh, at an engineering firm. After about a year, the firm uh, went under, there was an economic um, recession. Sound familiar, he lost his job. 
uh, needed to find something, so he took work as a laborer in a steel mill. He wasn't the most robust, strapping guy. It, it really killed him. He hated it, uh, so he quit. Then he went into teaching. He worked as a public school teacher, but was really interested in literature. And some friends that he met at the Literary Society in Boston said, you know, you should be an attorney. So he studied uh, law, took the bar exam, but prepared so hard for the bar exam that he made himself sick. Uh, and on medical advice, he moved to New Mexico to live in the open for three years. I don't exactly know what that means. The history is a little sketchy, okay? This is about 100 years ago. Then he moves back to Boston, runs for mayor, lost with less than 1% of the vote, um, took a job at what is now Kansas State University, was fired from that post, then finally moved back to Boston, persuaded a wealthy philanthropist to fund what became known as the Vocation Bureau of Boston, which opened in 1908. He presided at the opening, but then got sick a few months later, and about six months after that, he died, okay? So this is the father of vocational guidance. His career as a, a career counselor was uh, nine months in total, and everything leading up to that uh, obviously was very, very chaotic. But he did write some interesting things down, and after his death, his friends um, he was a very endearing guy, apparently, but his friends gathered up some of his stuff and put it together in a thin little book called Choosing a Vocation. And here is, sorry, that's the picture of uh, Parsons. Here's the classic quote from that book. In the wise choice of a vocation, there are three broad factors. Number one, a clear understanding of yourself. Number two, knowledge of the world of work. Okay, and number three, true reasoning on the, on the relations of these two groups of facts. So it's very simple, and this is a very pervasive and powerful idea. You understand how you're unique, you evaluate opportunities that are out there in the world of work, and you try to find a match. And when you find a match, that's a good choice. It's a good idea. Now, as it happens, that basic idea that um, the degree of fit is related to good outcomes, that's a testable hypothesis. And in my field of vocational psychology, and in other fields as well, management, organizational behavior, and so forth, this has been very uh, robustly tested in many, many studies. And when you have many, many studies that all look at a, the same kind of question, you can do what's called a meta-analysis, okay? You gather all these studies, look at the same question, and there are things that you can do to come up with a quantitative estimate of the strength of the relationship, in this case, between fit, and outcomes. So what does the research say? Well, what it says, and these are, these are correlations. So if you're not familiar with a correlation coefficient, the closer you get to one or negative one, the stronger the relationship is, and the closer you get to zero, the weaker the relationship is. And in the social sciences, we get all Twitter-pated and excited when a correlation hits 0.3 or higher, okay? So, so these are actually fairly robust correlations. Um, and I've got a pointer here, let's see if it works. So you see 0.56 is the correlation between person job fit and job satisfaction. So the better the fit people are with the job that they're in, the more satisfied they tend to be. Similar magnitude of correlation between person organization fit and organizational commitment. So the more of a fit you are with your organization, the more committed you'll be to it. Satisfaction with coworkers. The closer a fit you are with your team, there we go, the more satisfied you are with the people you work with, and the same thing applies with supervisor. The closer the fit you are with a supervisor, the more satisfied you are with that person. So this is not just a cool idea. When you test it uh, using social science methods, you find that sure enough, fit really does matter. Now, I'm going to tell you a story about a, a different kind of superhero, Roger Visker, because the idea of fit is a powerful one, but it does take effort. You've got to find out a lot of information about yourself. You've got to engage in a lot of exploration. And if you're thinking about this in terms of calling, a lot of times you want to jump that ship. You want to short circuit it and kind of ask God or the universe or whatever it is that you stake your claims on to reveal to you 
what your path is, what your calling is. I call this the pray and wait approach, where you pray very strongly asking for some kind of revelation. And if it doesn't come, you pray harder and wait longer. Now, I'm a person of faith. I believe in the power of prayer. Don't discourage that. And patience is a virtue. Um, but things don't always happen that way. However, they did for Roger. So Roger uh, always, his whole life, wanted to be a cop. He was single-minded, wanted to be a cop. In fact, in his eighth grade graduation program, it said, career goal, I want to be a policeman. So even then, he knew he wanted to be a cop. He liked everything about it. It got him very excited. And so he oriented his path to become a cop, studied criminal justice, um, took a position in the Kalamazoo Township Police Department and very quickly rose up the ranks until he was patrol lieutenant, which in that department is second in command. He loved the job. He was very, very good at it, was widely recognized by his peers as an outstanding cop. And then one day, all of that changed. He remembers the date. He remembers sitting at his kitchen table for breakfast, and he heard a voice. Like Moses in the desert, he heard a voice, and it said, Roger, I want you to leave your job as a police officer, and I want you to become a pastor. And not just that, but he said, and here is the person who I want to replace you in your role as patrol lieutenant, and here are seven people that I want you to talk to. And this voice proceeded to list the names of seven people that Roger knew that were in his life. And just like that, the voice went away. And, you know, it's funny to talk to Roger and hear him tell this story. He said, I looked across the table. There was no one there. Um, I can't tell you if it was an audible voice or not. I can just tell you that my ears experienced it as if it were an audible voice, if it wasn't. So Roger has this very dramatic calling experience that he wasn't looking for, but it happened. He told his wife, hoping she would say, you're crazy, or maybe you ate something bad, or um, you know, we need to think about this harder. Instead, she said, if this is what God wants us to do, let's figure it out. So he proceeded to start figuring it out. Now remember, Roger was given by this voice seven names, okay? So he decided, instead of just sort of making this decision right now, he said, I'm gonna engage in this exploration. I'm gonna to talk to these seven people. And so these are critical steps that Roger took. Here's a table that lists what the seven people told him. And I'm calling them here the seven messengers because that sounds kind of apocalyptic somehow. Um, the seven people that Roger talked to gave him this. First, some advice, read, what color is your parachute? I don't know if there are people who are familiar with that book here, but it's this classic career self-help book. Number two, some more advice, meet with a career counselor. Take some assessments. Number three, some more advice, get input from your pastor. Talk to him about what the job is like and what he thinks about this whole thing. Number four, you received a lot of encouragement and affirmation. These were people who were friends, who were acquaintances, who had Roger's best interests in mind. And then number five, he got modeling because the common thread tying these seven people together was that all of them had gone through or were currently in the process of a career change. Okay? Now what's interesting, and this actually struck me after I, I wrote the book, or I would have put it in there. What struck me was that um, this is another one of these examples where what, uh, what people perceive as coming from God aligns with what we know from psychological science. I explained to you what a meta-analysis was. Well, there's another meta-analysis that looks at um, career interventions. And this is my field, vocational psychology. We care about you know, what does effective career counseling look like. And there's a lot of experiments that randomly assign people to conditions, one a certain type of career counseling intervention, and another control group or a different kind of intervention. And then they measure outcomes and see what the results are. Well, the question in this meta-analysis uh, which was published in 2000, it's kind of a famous study that's cited a lot, was what are the critical ingredients of particularly effective career interventions? And as it turns out, there were five, five critical ingredients 
that tended to show up in interventions that were more effective, but be absent from interventions that were less effective. And here they are. Number one, written goal setting exercises. Setting goals is very important. Not only that, if you write them down, there's something symbolic about putting them down on paper that increases your level of commitment into them. Uh, number two, individualized interpretation and feedback. Okay, so give me information about myself, make it personal. Number three, accurate occupational information. So you remember Parsons' second step, you know, a true understanding of the world of work. In order to get that, you need good information. Number four, building support from important others. Don't make decisions in a vacuum. You make this decision in a community. Bring in people who care about you, get their support. And then the fifth thing, modeling. Okay, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can turn to people in your life who have exhibited these kinds of behavior, who've gone through this process and can show you how it's done. Now, obviously, there's a reason I have these two tables and put them in parallel here. Uh, if, if you know what color is your parachute, there are a lot of written goal setting exercises in there. Meeting with a career counselor, taking assessments is what you need to do in order to get individualized interpretation and feedback. Input from a pastor is exactly what Roger needed to get accurate occupational information. Yeah, of course, a lot of these seven people were this, his friends, his acquaintances. They wanted the best for him and provided a lot of encouragement. And then finally, since all of them were going through a career change or had done so, he could look to them as examples of people who had gone through it. I see stuff like this, these kinds of convergences, and I pay attention. You know, this matters. There are lessons that we can take from this. So just by way of summary, when I'm asked this question, how do I discern my calling? I give a very long answer, uh, but it can be summarized this way. Um, pray, don't pray and wait, pray and be active, but pray. Uh, understand your gifts and how you're unique. And there's uh, a lot of assessments that can be useful. There's a lot of uh, exercises that people can do to understand their gifts, how they're different from other people. Explore how your gifts align with opportunities not just different jobs, but also needs in the world. There's a sense of social fit. Are there needs that I observe in the world around me that speak to my heart, that I resonate with? And is there some sense that my gifts might equip me to address those needs in some way, either directly or indirectly? Seek wise counsel. And the wise counsel can be from mentors, from friends. It can be from a career counselor. Right? It's using resources that are available to you. And then finally, account for other callings in life. Okay, work is a very important part of life. Most of us spend more hours working than doing anything else other than sleeping. Uh, but work is not the only part of life. It's not the only important part of life. And uh, I think it's very reasonable to say that there's more than one calling. Although we like to use that word when we're talking about work, we have callings in other domains of life as well. It's very important to take that into account when you're asking this question about where I'm called to serve in the world of work. Now the question is, what difference does this make? What difference does this make? Okay, and now this is, this is an empirical question, and I, I see some eyes glazing over with the figure. This is very elegant, isn't it? Isn't it a thing of beauty? <laughs> this is an output from uh, confirmatory factor analysis, which is a statistical technique that's involved in scale construction. I will spare you the details uh, about what's involved in constructing a scale, uh, but one of the things that uh, I was fortunate to do with some colleagues and graduate students was develop this scale designed to measure calling. We started with 180 items and through this long iterative process involving all kinds of statistics, we got it down to 24 and they look like that. Okay, some sample items, to, just to give you a flavor of what we assess. I was drawn by something beyond myself to pursue my current line of work. My work helps me live out my life's purpose. Making a difference for others is the primary motivation in my career. And there are nine other items like this designed to measure the extent to which a person feels that they have a calling. Okay, and then there's uh, 12 other items we measure search for calling. But you, when you do this, you can take that score and then you can correlate it with scores on, that are or with scores on scales that are designed to measure other interesting and useful things. And that's what we've done. And so we can answer this question, what difference does it make? 
Don't take my word for it. You can look at the data and see what the answers are there. For students, the extent to which college students think of their career as a calling, uh, and that's career globally, so your future career, your current educational pathway, scores on that measure of calling and other measures of calling that have been developed are positively correlated with all kinds of beneficial things. Career maturity, so are you doing the things that you should be doing at this stage in your career? Self-efficacy, that's how confident are you in your ability to make good career decisions? Self-clarity, knowledge of yourself, work hope, which is a type of optimism for your future career, and then academic satisfaction. Students who think of their career as a calling tend to be happier with what they're getting from their college experience. When we've looked at this with employed adults, we see the same kind of pattern. Scores on presence of calling were positively related to job satisfaction, career commitment, how committed are you to your, to your career and to your organization. People experience work as more meaningful. Uh, they're more attached to the organization. This is negatively related to withdrawal intentions. So the more people feel that they have a calling, the less likely they are to be looking for other jobs. And then in terms of general well-being, viewing your work as a calling is related to satisfaction with life as a whole. It spills over just from the career domain to influence how you think about life in general. People who score high on these measures of calling also score higher on measures of life meaning. They view life as more meaningful, and they're able to cope more effectively with challenges that they confront. An interesting question is, is it enough to, is it enough to perceive a calling? So I sense that I have a calling. I know what it is. OK, so what? Is that the same thing as living it out? Is it possible to sense that you have a calling but not be able to live it out in your day to day? And this is what we've become interested in very recently. So we des design another scale to measure living a calling. And those two scales are correlated 0.5. I said before, we get all Twitter pated when we see 0.3. Um, so 0.5 uh, is a strong correlation it suggests that these things are related. But it's not so high to suggest that they're the same thing. Okay? These are distinct constructs. And so it is actually possible to perceive a calling, but not to live one out. And in fact, when you look at correlations between perceiving a calling and living a calling with all these outcomes, work meaning, career commitment, job satisfaction, all these positive things, they're actually stronger for scores on the, the scale that measures living a calling than it is for perceiving a calling. And I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I'll go over this very briefly. Um, there is an interaction between these things. There is a relationship between perceiving a calling, low, medium, and high, and career commitment such that that relationship is only positive for people who are high in living a calling. So it's not enough to sense that you have one. You have to be living it out. And the same pattern was found uh, even stronger for work meaning. So. People who perceive a calling um, tend to find work meaningful, but only if they're living it out. And in fact, we're starting to get a little bit more sophisticated in the way we can answer these questions. And so now we're building this theoretical model. Uh, perceiving a calling is related to job satisfaction. If I sense that I have a calling, I'm, more, I'm likely to be satisfied with my job. Well, why? Well, one of the reasons why is because people who perceive a calling are more committed to their careers. Okay? And another reason why is that people who perceive a calling tend to find their work very meaningful. But those relationships are only true if people are living a calling. Okay? That's enough statistical stuff. Uh, the other question then is, if it's not enough to perceive a calling, to sense that you have one, if you have to find ways to live it out, what does it mean to live out a calling? What does that look like? for people, especially in an environment, an economic climate, where we don't have unconstrained choice. You know, not everybody is going to find their dream job right out of college. And some people are in jobs they didn't necessarily choose, uh, but that just feel too risky to consider leaving. Are they doomed to a life of misery? <laughs> or are there things that they can do within their current job uh, to make things better? to align things more with a sense of calling. And I really like collecting stories from people who seem to be experiencing this in unexpected places. 
So one example, I remember very clearly, a student came into my office. This was back when we were working on that scale. Uh, and she said, I got to tell you what happened to my husband this weekend. Her husband was driving through the mountains in Colorado and then got stuck. Uh, it's a two-lane highway, uh, but you know how it goes. They close one of the lanes down to patch a spot in the road or something like that. And inevitably, you see guys like this, right, wearing the orange vest. This is an actual job title, road construction flagger. They don't take turns doing this. You can actually get certified as a flagger. So you sit, stand on one end of the construction site. There's another one on the other end. You've got a two-way radio. And you stand holding this sign that says slow on one side and stop on the other side. You've seen these people. You're usually not that happy to see them because it means that they're likely to change the, the sign from slow to stop right as you're about to, uh, to approach them. And that is, in fact, what happened to my student's husband. So he stopped there in his car right in front of this road construction flagger. And it's a nice day. He's got his windows down, you know, strike up conversation. He's a pretty extroverted guy. Why not? So he says, how can you stand that job? <laughs> I mean, it has got to be the most mind-numbing thing. Uh, how do you do this day in and day out? Uh, and, and his reaction surprised him because uh, instead of rolling his eyes and saying, you don't even know, or something like that, this road construction flagger perks up and he says, you know, I love my job. And I'll tell you why I love my job. I love my job because I care about these guys behind me and I keep them safe. And I care about you and all the people in the cars that are now lining up behind you. And I keep you safe. And I am grateful that I was led to this job and can do this every day where I make a difference like this. Now that is, is surprising, but it's also inspiring. It is inspiring because not many of us in this room, I'm guessing, aspire uh, to a career in a job like that. But if somebody like that can experience that kind of meaning in a job like that, what can the rest of us do, right? I mean, what can, the, what can you do? What can I do? As another example, whoops, as another example, uh, and this is not the picture of this actual person, neither was the other one, I'm sorry. I, I, um, uh, but I've got four small children. When you have four small children, stuff happens, and you end up in the hospital from time to time. And um, this happened, and, and the janitor that was assigned to our room uh, was this woman named Maggie Garza. She was in her 60s, and she was just this very remarkable person. Now, if you're in the hospital with a, a kid who's sick, you're not a real happy camper. Now, this is not like a happy situation to be in. But Maggie would come to our room, and it got to the point where we felt like she made us feel like that visit to our room was the most important thing that she had to do every day. Uh, because she would come in, she, was, um, she had this very charismatic, but very nurturing, kind of sympathetic personality. And, and she would say things like, you've got such a beautiful baby. Uh, and she would say, I've been praying for your baby. And um, one of the times we were in there was actually right after we had had one of these children. And so she would um, empathize with my wife, who was in lingering pain from childbirth. Um, she would clean and do an impeccably good job. But for her, her job was about providing health care. Now, this is a janitor, OK? A janitor. In most organizations, this is a job that's low on the totem pole, right? But she, her vision of her work was as providing quality health care to her patients. And that's what she called them. She called them her patients. Okay. Again, this is inspiring because you do not necessarily expect this. But when you see it, you ask this question. If this person can do that, what can I do? What can you do? And that's where I want to end tonight with this classic story that Isaiah heard from Matt earlier this afternoon, um, about three workers who were breaking up rocks. Okay, The first one was asked, well, all three were asked, what are you doing? The first one said, making little ones out of big ones. The second one said, earning a living. And the third one said, building a cathedral. 
And that's, that really illustrates this notion of job crafting, of taking a job and um, rethinking it, linking the gritty particulars of what you're doing day in and day out to some kind of broader, overarching purpose that matters to you. And that's really the question that we all have to face, is what cathedral are we building? Whether you work on the line, whether you work in IT, whether you teach at a university, whether you're studying to do business, uh, or become a nurse, or whatever it is, what cathedral are you building? And with that, if anyone has any questions, I would be delighted to see what I can do to answer them. There's a microphone in the back. Hi there, my name is Austin George. Um, I was wondering what drives you to do what you do right now? And uh, how do you feel about it? Well, thanks, Austin. Uh, you know, I told this story over lunch. I, I, I relate a little bit to Frank Parsons, not in quite the same way, but this, um, like many people who find something that they feel is a calling, it is very autobiographical. And I always struck, when I was in your situation as a student, I really had a hard time making decisions. It wasn't that I didn't like anything, it was that I liked everything. And I really like to keep options open. And it was very, very difficult for me to choose um, one career path when doing that meant not choosing other things that seemed pretty interesting to me. And so I was one of these students who started getting letters from the registrar saying, you're a junior now, uh, you've not declared a major, we're going to have a hold on your record until you tell us what to put as your major. And, um, you know, so I did all these kinds of things. I went to career counseling, um, ended up going to graduate school in counseling psychology, which is a very broad field. And the breadth of that field was a perfect fit for me because it meant I could then delay the decision even longer of what I was going to do uh, when I grew up. Um, but when in the process of studying this stuff as a graduate student, one of the things that we did in the graduate program at Minnesota, which, which was um, fairly, had a long history in vocational psych. In fact, there was a clinic there, a vocational assessment clinic it was called. And I found myself there working with clients in a counseling role, people who were middle career, they were fast risers, many of them. They got great jobs in law firms and businesses, got their MBA, uh, and, and making a lot of money, but were miserable. You know, they got to this point where they just, it was just hard to get out of bed and go in and, and do it again. Um, and, and they would spontaneously use this word calling to describe what it was that they were looking for, something that really resonated deeply with their values uh, and, and um, that, that just was a good fit with um, their gifts and with what they felt they were on this earth to do. And so um, that got me thinking, you know, I'm struggling with my own career development. These people are. I started doing a lot of reading uh, around this topic, realized nobody was really doing much psychological research on it, and I, it was what I was being trained to do. So I started doing that with an eye toward coming up with interventions, ways to use what we learn from science to help people. Uh, and, and so in this weird kind of paradoxical wounded healer sense, um, you know, my calling became studying calling, uh, which which really for me is about helping people develop their potential, you know, understand how they're unique and what implications that has, not just for what they end up doing in the world, but how they can contribute to the greater good. Um, so, you know, like any job, and probably everyone here who, who really loves what they do, there are things about it that you have to do that you don't like. Um, but in terms of the grand vision of doing that, of helping people, um, understand more about themselves in ways that help them make good decisions about where they can contribute in the world and glorify God and, and serve the common good. Um, that I feel really good about, you know, where I am. And that's my hope for everyone is that they, you know, would, would uh, it means different things for different people, but 
um, that people would, would end up in a spot where um, they can say that that's where they are. What tools are you going to use to encourage your four children to explore vocations? And how, what age are they right now? <laughs> um, it's a great question. Um, they are two, four, seven, and nine, all boys. And um, as far as tools, you know, there, of course, this is a developmental process. And uh, we sometimes talk about what do you want to be when you grow up, that kind of thing. There is some danger of, of getting locked in too young. And they call this some, um, in the career literature, they call this foreclosure, where somebody from early on just says they want to be a doctor. And so they pour everything into pursuing medicine. And then as a sophomore, they take organic chemistry. And it all comes crumbling down. And because they've been so focused on becoming a doctor, they haven't really thought about anything else. And it's like, well, now what? I'm gonna, you know, I don't know, know what to do. So to me, to deal with that, what we encourage um, our children to do is just be very active. Get involved in things, try different things out. If you have an interest that you're really excited about, great. Cultivate that, pour yourself into it. But we value well-roundedness. Uh, and so exploring, trying out different things, um, people uh, or kids really start to develop a sense of what they're good at, what they enjoy, um, but also you know what they aren't good at and what they don't enjoy. And the hope is that over time, that process, along with us just showering them with um, our values about what is important in the world, and um, you know this isn't for you; it's it's for what you can do for other people and that kind of thing. Hopefully, you know, uh, we pray anyway that it will um, move them in, in a path that where they can one day say, I think I've discovered what my calling is and I'm doing what I can now to live it out. Phil's got a question up here. Thanks so much. I wonder if you could go back to Uncle Ben here for a moment and uh, explore that axiom. Because, of course, there are people who have no sense of power, mm -hmm. and there are people who have no sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. So if you can get a little deeper into the relationship between those two, um, how do you help a person who has no idea that they are gifted? Mm -hmm. And how do you help a person who has a deep sense that they have all this that they can do, but feel no sense of social responsibility to use as well? Yeah, and <laughs> that's a great question and it's a challenging one because there is a sense in which, in the latter case, when somebody feels that they have no responsibility, you know, that's a value that they, as a, you could state it positively, they've got other values other than that. And so there's this, um, there's this, you know, it's difficult to convince someone who doesn't see that as important that it really is. And the best way to do that, and I think there was some discussion around what we do as educators, is put people in a position where they experience things, um, pain that other people have, uh, in, a, in a powerful way where they can identify um, with, that, with that person or that group of people or whatever. And you know, there's a lot of ways to do that through media, through traveling, through um, you know, looking here in your own community for people who. Um, so it's getting out, it's volunteering, it's putting yourself in a situation where you identify and empathize. This was part of the lunchtime uh, discussion, I think, where, uh, with people who are less fortunate than you are. That's probably the best way to begin to change a person's perception and get them to realize that there is a sense of responsibility that we have. And for people who are powerless, um, you know, that of course is a huge question because, and it's one that we, we deal with a lot in, in my discipline because it's like when, you've, when you're working with, let's say you're working with an individual client who's oppressed, uh, who has no power in, in this system, well, you can do what you can to help that person forge a path in this um, environment where it feels like everything is working against them, but of course that doesn't change 
the environment that is there, the structures that are there in the first place. And so I resonate with Calvin on that point. Our social structures themselves are vulnerable to brokenness. Now, to fix that stuff, you know, obviously it's very complicated. It involves policy and resources and all of that stuff. But um, when there is an individual in my office, and, I, um, and I'm not real active in career counseling right now, but I had been for quite a while, um, I've had that experience where someone comes in who's from a very disadvantaged background and then you give them an abilities test and it comes back and everything's low, you know. Uh, so this is not a, uh, let's change the way you're thinking about yourself. It's um, the, the operating assumption, and it's one that I really believe, is still this person has gifts. This person has gifts. Uh, this is a unique individual who has something to contribute. Now, it may require being kind of creative, you know, in terms of figuring out what that looks like. But I think of the road construction flaggers, I think of the Maggie Garza's cleaning rooms in the hospital, uh, and I think if they can do it, there's got to be a way where we can take this person and, and work together to get from where they are now to a situation where they feel like they're doing something meaningful, using what they've got to contribute somehow to the world around them. And it's a huge question, but in a, in a nutshell, that's the best I can do. How do you get people who are so desperate just to get a job to focus on vocation? Yeah, another great question, and, and you know, this is, I'm usually, I'm, I'm, I didn't say, use the, these, this phrase here, but a lot of times when I talk about this, I tell people, this is not a panacea, you know. Uh, we do live in a real world where people have very significant constraints, and talk about responsibilities, if, if uh, and, and I've got, I've had friends, I have friends now who are in that situation where they've got families to feed and they are missing payments because they just have no income and they can't find a job and they've been jobless for you know 18 months or whatever it is. What do you do to find vocation in a situation like that? Well, you know, um, work is one part of life and, and you know your responsibilities extend beyond being true to yourself in the, in the work role. Um, so it makes sense to fo have a laser focus on what can I do to um, find income to meet the obligations and responsibilities I have. But um, I always say take the long view, you know? Just like your first job out of college is not necessarily going to be your dream job that will allow you to express all of your, uh, your areas of uniqueness in ways that, that um, start to change the world. Uh, it's okay to take a step back and say, I'm in this situation. There are things that I can learn from this. This is shaping me. Um, I will do what I need to do now to meet my obligations, but I'm building towards something else. And that kind of optimism and hope can be really powerful for people um, who are in that situation. It doesn't make it easy, uh, you know, and, and it is difficult to talk about, you know, because it feels like platitudes. Um, but nevertheless, um, I, I think it's still, still relevant and can be useful and powerful, um, so. Can you speak to the other side of that? Uh, somebody who, and you touched on it earlier, someone who may make a very good living, uh, that doesn't, that may not want to take the risk of losing it all for, the fa for their family or for their means. Uh, can you talk to that side uh, of it? Um, maybe they are using the gifts that they have very well and being very successful, but might not feel the calling side of that mm -hmm. and, and how they can reconcile that risk uh, with their family and with their, their economical situation. Yeah, there the situation is a little bit different and uh, a lot of people use the phrase golden handcuffs. You know, it's like I'm chained to this job that I hate by uh, this huge salary and great benefits and prestige that I have. And, and if I thought about changing now, people would say, what are you thinking? 
you're crazy. You kind of get used to this lifestyle. It feels pretty good. You'd be giving up an awful lot. Um, you know, so what motivation does someone like that have to change? Well, you know, if you go through life and things start to feel, you start to feel unhappy with what you're doing every day, you can persist in that mode for a while, but for some people, and these are the folks that would come into our clinic, um, you can only take that for so long. And some people became so miserable, uh, it, it would lead to, you know, full-blown depression and physical symptoms, back pain, cardiac concerns, you know. When it comes down to is, you know, we're on this earth for a brief period of time. <laughs> um, you can't take it with you. And so what are you going to do with the time that you have? Uh, and it's a hard conversation to have with people who are doing very well and, and don't feel a sense of responsibility. Um, but when people become miserable, even when things are going very well from the outside, it becomes a much easier conversation to have. And people are surprisingly willing to take risks and give stuff up when the trade-off is very meaningful. What advice would you give to your <coughs> freshman and sophomore age self now? Would you tell yourself to do anything differently if you were able to come back and talk to yourself at that age? That's a very good question. Um, it, it's to me, it's the. I mean, I was sort of 100% into that pray and wait mode. Um, you know, I really, I actually, I knew Roger Visker at that point, and that's what I wanted. You know, this sort of Moses in the desert, and and uh, you know, one of the career counselors I went to said, "Oh, well, you just, you just want me to tell you what you should do because you don't want to take the responsibility of making the choice yourself." And that made me upset, but at the same time, I recognized that she was spot on. Uh, and so if I could go back and talk to myself then, I would say, pray, keep praying, sure, but pray and be active. You know, get out there, um, talk to people, take the assessments, learn about yourself, explore, be patient, but do stuff. You know, and um, there's plenty of research evidence suggesting that when people are actively engaged, in the development process, things don't happen overnight, but the outcomes happen a lot quicker and are much better um, than if, if they have that pray and wait kind of attitude. The one other thing I'd tell myself is, it's okay to take a step of faith and trust that things will work out. So some people say, oh, are you called to be a counseling psych or a vocational psychologist? Uh, and, and people are surprised by this, but I don't see things that way. I see a calling as much broader. There are several other things I was considering at that time. How would things have been different if I had chosen one of those other paths? Sociology, social work, business, ministry. If I was still using my gifts in ways that I felt you know, glorified God and enhanced the common good, I think I could have done any of those things and been faithful to my calling. Right? So it's not always very specific and clear Sometimes you get a good sense and then you just do it and, uh, and trust that things will work out. And, and of course, it's an ongoing process. Right? You never arrive and ride off happily into the sunset. It takes work, it takes effort, just like anything that's worthwhile. So. Okay, well, the microphone ended up in my hand, so. <laughs> If there are no other questions, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. You are welcome to talk with Brian after the session here, but thank you again, and let's thank Dr. Dick. <laughs>